Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Lady is a Corpse by John D. MacDonald, Part 1, The Build-Up. Park Faulkner took a deep breath, exhaled half of it, squeezed the trigger slowly. The rifle spat, a sound as vicious as an angry wasp. Far out across the dancing blue water of the gulf, the glint of the can jerked, disappeared. Enough, he said. He stood the rifle in the corner of the private terrace that opened off his bedroom, the highest terrace of the vast gleaming white fortress that dominated the two-mile sand spit called Grouper Island and sometimes Faulkner Island. He stretched and yawned. He was a tall, spare, walk-hard man in his mid-thirties. A tropical disease had eliminated forever hair, eyebrows, lashes. His eyes were a startlingly pale shade against the sun-glossed mahogany of his skin. There was a touch of cruelty in the beaked nose and set of the mouth, and humor as well. He wore faded, singly sarong, knotted at the waist. I should think it is enough, Taffy Angus said in her hoarse, gayman's voice. She stood on her hands, her heels against the wall of the house, her white hair hanging with fluid lines to the terrace tiles. She wore a bandana as a halter, and the jeans, salt faded to powder blue, were hacked off raggedly at knee length. The position brought a flush under her tan. "'Does that make you a junior leaguer?' Faulkner asked. "'Don't be nasty, darling,' she said. She dropped onto hands and toes, came gracefully up onto her feet. "'I'm an old, old gal, as you well know, and a daily handstand has therapeutic values.' Faulkner looked at her admiringly. "'Bless you. You're my favorite neighbor. When I forget you're forty-two, I feel like a cradle-snatcher.' In my prime, I came a little after the Gibson girl, Park. But just to change the subject, how about those people who are coming? Park looked at his watch. The cocktail hour approacheth. Go prettily thyself, wench. She bowed low. Sire, she breathed. Her lips thinned a little. Park, just for the record, couldn't we drop the Mussolini edict about living dangerously and grow fat and happy in the sunshine on your money? These people you ask here. They had walked to the hallway door. He opened it and gently shoved her through. Okay, okay, she sighed. I never opened my full mouth. Faulkner shut the door. His smile faded. Taffy knew as well as he did what had happened those times he had tried stagnation. He had grown restless, irritable. There was no point in trying to add to the funds, which was more than he could possibly spend in his lifetime. The company the equally affluent brought a sickening boredom and so life had to be spiced by the house parties, an amateur cop, or a god of vengeance. Take your choice. Flip a coin. When there's guilt in the air, it can be scented as an animal scents the odor of fear. He looked along the beach to the spot where one of his house guests, Carl Brannick, had killed Laura Hale. For a moment, there was revulsion in him, and he wanted to call this newest house party off. Then he remembered the report from the New York agency, and his interest began to quicken. He crossed the big room to the built-in record player. He pondered a tonal stuff would probably help tension along better than anything traditional. He selected two hours of Milhod, Schoenberg, and Antheil, stacked them on the spindle, cut in the amplifiers of the sea-level terrace where they would have cocktails and the amplifiers in the East Gardens, and then adjusted the volume down for background. The only thing in the big room not suitable to a practicing Sybarite was the hard, narrow cot on which he slept. There were deep couches, a massive gray stone fireplace, paintings of a certain freedom, and deep niches softly lighted. He untied the sarong, dropped it, stepped out of it. The shower stall was big enough to hold a seven-handed poker game. The dressing room adjoined the bath. As he was telling himself, he heard the descending roar of the amphib. That would be Lou Chazerac, flying in the ladies, right on schedule. He selected a gray casual shirt trousers of a deeper shade of gray. As he walked from the dressing room into the bedroom, he heard Lou's knock at the door. Lou came in, 
His boxer's pup's face slyly wrinkled. He turned with an expansive gesture. Look what I got. A blonde and a brunette, both tall and grave, with knowing eyes, sweet wise mouth. The blonde Lucette is Georgie Wayne. Black is called June Luce. Say hello to the boss girls. How do you do, Mr. Faulkner, they said gravely, almost in unison. Nice to see you. You know what the job is? Georgie the blonde turned spokesman. If the job includes anything over and above what Mr. Impero stated, Mr. Faulkner, the deal is off. I want that understood. Park grinned. I left out a few details, but nothing either of you will balk at. Four young men are coming to visit me. They should be along any minute now. You are each being paid fifty dollars a day. I want you to be as charming as possible to my guests, and I insist that they be kept in ignorance of the fact that I'm paying you. Now here's the additional instruction. There are two of you and four young men. Both of you are lovely enough to have learned how to handle men. I want them played off against each other. I want their beautiful friendship split up in any way you can manage it. Each night at twelve, you go off duty as far as I'm concerned. Lou will show you your rooms right now. The doors lock. You have the freedom of the place. We're well equipped for amusement here. Tennis, badminton, swimming, in the golf and in the pool. There is only one restriction. I do not want either of you to leave the island until, in my opinion, the job is done. Fair enough, June Luce said. But who are we supposed to be? Park grinned. Call yourself nieces of mind. That ought to spice their imaginations a little. When Lou took them out, Faulkner went down two flights to the kitchens. Mrs. Mick Rogers, cook and wife of the battered ex-pug, who was Park's man of all work, smiled at him. Francie, the doughy little maid, was at one of the work tables finishing the construction of a tray of canapes. Except for the deluge, Mrs. Mick? Faulkner asked. What's eight people counting yourself? A nothing. Practice yet. Just then, Mick drove in across the private causeway from the mainland with a station wagon. Park walked out the side door of the smaller kitchen and across to the parking space. Mick slid neatly to a stop. The first one got out, looked hesitantly at Faulkner. I'm, I'm Bill Hewitt. Are you the host? Hewitt was tall, fragile, gangly. Physically, he seemed barely out of his adolescence, but his pale blue eyes were knowing, and there was a downward sardonic twist about his wide mouth. Glad to see you, Hewitt. Let me see. You're the copywriter, aren't you? Right. With Lantine, Saren, and Howlis. I write deathless prose for TV commercials. And this is Prine Smith, our newspaper man. Prine was dark, stocky, muscular, with a square, strong jaw and an aggressive handshake, he said. We're pretty much in the dark about all this, Faulkner, and... Park smiled. Let's talk about it over cocktails. Hewlett broke in. And this is the actor in the group, Guy Jarana. Guy was tall, with a superb body, Classic profile, brown, tightly curled hair, but there was a vacant docility about his expression, an aimless, childlike amiability in his eyes. How are you, he said softly in the richest of baritones. The fourth, alas, was a wiry redhead, with pointed features, a jittery, hyperthyroid manner. You hear that, he said? The actor in the group he calls Dorana. What about me? What about Stacy Bryan? I make with a voice on the radio. Character parts. I work it all. All that hunk has to do is revolve slowly to give them a look at both sides of the profile. Radio is a dying medium, Dorana said languidly. Faulkner sensed that it was an old argument. He shook hands with Stacy Bryan. Mick Rogers was taking the luggage from the tailgate. We'll take our own stuff up. Don't bother, Hewitt said. Mick, you show them their rooms, Park said. As soon as you all freshen up, find your way down to that front terrace. You can see it from here. Faulkner went back up to his room started the music, went back down to the front terrace. Mick had already changed to white jacket, and he was putting the small terrace bar in order. Jittery as hell, Mick said, all of them, and seven thousand questions. I didn't know nothing. Make the drinks heavy on the boys, Mick, and lay off our two hired tootsies. Festivities about to begin? Taffy said, close behind him. Park turned. She wore a white blouse, pulled down off her deeply tanned shoulders, the gay skirt swung as she walked. A hammered silver Aztec bracelet looked impossibly heavy on her slim wrist. Her white hair was a pure form of silver, heavy, thick, molten, alive. Jezebel, he whispered, Lilith, Carithna of the Purple Seas. 
don't mind me, Mick said. This, said Taffy, is what you get from inviting little girls who could be my daughters. I have to keep up my morale. There was no more time for talk then because Stacy Bryan came out into the terrace. The sun was slipping toward the gray-blue gulf. The others came, were introduced. Mick was chanting, Step up and name it, and I can make it. They go down like honey and then kick you behind the ear. Taffy sat on the wall and looked smug. She made Georgie and June look awkward, young, and she made the others look. She winked solemnly at Park Falkner. Conversation was general, polite, aimless. Georgie Wayne had inconspicuously drifted to the side of Guy Durana. He looked at her with mild, sleepy approval. June Luce said in a silky, soft voice, "'Miss Angus, I must tell you, my mother took me to see you in time for play, oh, ages ago. I think it was six at the time. That was before you became such a successful model, wasn't it?' Park concealed his grin by taking a drink. June looked with rapt interest at Taffy. Taffy looked puzzled. She said, "'My goodness, now I know I'm ancient. I've just forgotten how to make Kitty talk. Why, if you'd said anything like that to me five years ago, I'd have thought of some nasty nice way to call attention to the way you're letting yourself get—' She stopped. "'Oh, I mustn't be rude. I'm sorry.' She beamed at June. June's eyes narrowed. "'What's wrong with me?' "'Nothing,' Sister Mick said. "'You're a nice dish.' You just ain't bright. You challenged the champ. Now shut up, or she'll make you so mad you'll be sick to your stomach, and she'll just sit there grinning at you. Taffy pouted. He never lets me have any fun. Prine Smith walked scowling over to Park, planted his feet, his stocky legs spread, his square hand holding the cocktail glass. Look, he said, I don't go for cat and mouse games. Maybe I'm not properly civilized, so you're a big enough shot to get strings pulled to get us all off at the same time. So you play on curiosity in a smart enough way to get us all down here, expenses paid? You out after laughs, Faulkner. Let's blow away the smoke screen and talk sense for a minute. Glad to, Park said. I guess I'm just a nosy type. I like mysteries. Nine months ago, the four of you lived in a big apartment in the village, two blocks from Sheridan Square. You split up now, but that was the status quo. Hewitt had, had a girlfriend, lovely from all reports named Lisa Mann. On a hot afternoon, June 4th to be exact, Lisa Mann, using a key that Hewitt had given her, let herself into the apartment. A girl named Alicia French happened to see her. Alicia lived in the next apartment down the hall. All four of you were able to prove that you were out that afternoon. The first one to get back to the apartment was Guy Durana. He returned a little after 11 that night. No one had seen Lisa Mann since. Apparently, she never returned to her own apartment. There was an investigation. Her parents are well-to-do. I asked you for down here because things like that intrigue me. I hope that during your stay here, one of you will, directly or indirectly, admit to his guilt in the death of Miss Mann. Does that blow away the smoke, Smith? Prime Smith stared at him. Are you crazy? Hewitt said softly. I know she's dead. I know it. She would have come back. Young girls disappear every day, Stacy Bryan said. That she happened to come to our place was coincidental. June and Georgie listened with great intentness. Their mouths opened a bit. Are you serious, Faulkner? Prine Smith asked, still scowling. Do you actually think that just by having us down here, you can break open a case that the Metropolitan Police haven't been able to unravel? Park shrugged. It might work that way. I don't get it. If one of us should be guilty, which is silly even to think of, wouldn't you have given him warning by now? Of course. Prime Smith sighed. Okay. Have your fun. It's your money, and I guess you know what you want to do with it. Me? I'm going to relax and enjoy myself. That's what you're all supposed to do, Park said amiably. Hewlett had been drinking steadily and with purpose. He said, Her eyes were tilted a little, and the black lashes were so long they were absurd. She came up to my shoulder, and when she laughed, she laughed deep in her throat. Knock it off, the red-headed Stacy Bryan said sharply. Drop it, Bill. Sure, Bill Hewitt said, sure. The dusk was upon them, and the music was a wry dirge. Taffy's face was shadowed. A gull swung by, tilting in the wind, laughing with disdain. The soft waves were the tired breath of the water. Death whispered in the thin jacaranda leaves. Hewitt laughed with excessive harshness. Sure, he said again. Forget her. 
We're all nice, clean young men, we four. Our best friends don't have to tell us because we've brought the right products. We have built-in value, four-way virtue. Remember the brand name. Go to your nearest crematory and ask for our product. That's a joke, son. But forget little dead girls because little dead girls have nothing in common with these four upright, sterling, time-tested young men of market-proven value. You can't write a commercial about a dead girl. The product will never sell. Shut up, Bill, I said. June hugged her elbows through the dusk was warm. Mick's face behind the bar was carved of dark stone. Over the mainland, a diesel train bellowed a distant creature of swamps and prehistory. You people can eat any time, Mrs. Mick said. Part 2. The Decoy Taffy lay on her face in the sun by the pool. Faulkner sat cross-legged beside her, rubbing the oil into the long, clean lines of her back. Mm, she said with sleepy appreciation. June came to the edge of the pool, her dark hair plastered wet to her head. She hung on and said, Hello, people. How goes the war of the sexes? Faulkner asked. June pursed her lips. Georgie has attracted the big, handsome hunk, Guy Dorana, and also Mr. Muscles, the newspaper guy. I'm love for the agile little redhead who can sling passes from any off-balance position. Hewitt is not interested. How is Georgie doing? Reasonable. Guy and Prine Smith are now on the beach showing off. Back to the battle, June Park directed. Take Stacy Bryan down there and see if you can confuse things. June swam away. Taffy yawned. Legs, she said. Park moved down a bit, filled his palm with oil. Taffy sat up suddenly. No, dearie. I think I do this myself. She said she took the bottle from him. An aged creature like me has to be well smeared with his glob, or the wrinkles pop out like wasteland erosion. As she worked, she looked over at him. Faulkner, my man, this little house party makes me feel physically ill. Why don't you break it up? Just when everybody's having so much fun? Fun? They've all got the jumps. Sure they have. Right from the beginning, each of them, the three unguilty ones, whoever they might be, have had a sturdy little suspicion. They were trying to forget it. Now I've reawakened the whole thing. They're drinking too much and laughing too loudly, and they're all wound up like a three-dollar watch. We just wait and see. Her brown eyes were suddenly very level, very grave. But you usually add another ingredient, Park. This time, too, maybe tonight? Do you really think one of them killed that girl? I do. But why, Taffy wailed. Why do people kill people? Love, money, position, hate, envy, passion, jealousy, lots of reasons. Please be careful, Park. Don't let anything happen to you. Am I that valuable? With you gone, what would I do for laughs? He leaned his hand tenderly against her bare shoulder and pushed her into the pool. He had gone apart from the others, and now he sat on the sand, with his hands locked around his knees, and he thought of the small, thin sound she had made as he struck her, and how he had caught her as she fell and listened, hearing the pulse that in his ears, the hard rasp of his own breathing. She had felt so heavy as he had carried her quickly to where he had planned. She was really a small girl. There was no blood. Again the dusk and the music and the cocktails, and Mick behind the bar and Taffy in the pale green, and all of them, sun stunned by the long hot day, tingling from the showers, ravenous, bright-eyed. I don't want to be a bore park, Prine Smith said, but what are you accomplishing? Faulkner shrugged. Nothing, I guess. Maybe we ought to talk, that is, if nobody objects. Talk, Bill Hewitt said tonelessly. Objectivity, Park said, is often easier at a distance. The police concentrated on the apartment. That, I feel, was a mistake. The fact that the body has not appeared indicates to me that it was a crime carefully planned, too carefully planned to assume that the murderer would select a city apartment as the scene of the crime and hope to get away with it, to walk out with a body. She was seen going into the apartment. She was not seen coming out. The apartment had a phone. All four of you were able to prove that you could not possibly have gotten back to the apartment before 11. But you couldn't prove, had you been asked to do so, that Lisa Mann had not come to you. She could have been summoned by phone to the place where she was murdered and where the body was disposed of so successfully. Just how do you dispose of a body successfully? Prine Smith asked fire, the sea, chemicals, but best of all legally, death certificate and a funeral. Something deep inside him laughed. The forest floor had been thick with loam, 
under the needles. He had scraped away the needles, and the edge of the new spade had bitten deeply easily. The hole was not long enough for her, and so he put her in curled on her side, her knees against her chest. Later, after he had patted the earth down, replaced the needles of the pines, he burned the new shovel handle in the old coveralls. He kicked the hot shovel blade over into the brush. No trace. None. Why would anyone kill her, he would ask. Why? She was my girl. There wasn't any question of that. What good would she do to anyone dead? Sometimes a man kills, Faulkner said, for the very simple reason that the act of killing gives him pleasure. It would be nice to meet him, he would said. Nice, he looked hard first at Guy, then Prine Smith, then Stacy Bryan. Off it, Prine said harshly. We were over that. You know the three of us, kid. You know we weren't capable of anything like that. Hewitt continued to stare, and there was a trace of madness in his eyes. Slowly it faded. He walked over to the bar. Make filled his glass. Hal said Stacy, Lisa may be wandering around right now. Amnesia. You can't tell about things like that. Sure, Hewitt said. Sure. It could be that. He didn't speak as though he believed it. On the way to dinner, Georgie Wayne took Park aside. Fifty a day, she said, is nice. I like it. You've got a nice place here. But how about this, uncle? One of these boys maybe clobbered a girl. It leads one to think. Maybe it's a habit yet? Not a habit. Not quite that. Call it a tendency. I thought maybe you could tell by looking at hands. I've been looking. No dice, uncle. I wouldn't say he would, didn't. Beyond that, I cannot go. Shouldn't a murderer look like a murderer? I knew one once who could have been your twin, Georgie. I can see how she got in the killing mood, Georgie said. At three in the morning, Faulkner awoke at the sound of the first tap on his door. He came completely awake in a fraction of a second. He pulled his robe on as he went to the door. It was taffy. She looked small, young, wan in the lamplight. You can't sleep either, huh, she said. What's got you down, Taffy asked. Come on in. They walked out onto the terrace. The wind was directly out of the west. It had sea fragrance. She said, you hear about something like this. I mean, it's a problem, like filling in a nine-letter blank beginning with G, meaning a South African herb. Then you meet the people, and it's something else again. Gee, they're nice kids. I don't want it to be one of them. He put his arm around her. Old Taff, the world mother. She loves everybody. Maybe I'm wrong this time. The agency checked it out pretty carefully, though. Lisa Mann was one of those people who make no enemies. No one profited by her death. She was exceptionally striking. Emotions can get wound up pretty tightly. If one of them did it, she said softly, I wonder if he's sleeping right now. I don't see how he could be, knowing that all this is supposed to make him give himself away. I've been watching them so carefully. It's not Hewlett, of course. Durana seems like a big sleepy animal, but he did come alive when he did that part out of his last play for us. Stacy Bryan is an awful nice little guy. Prine Smith is a little quarrelsome, but you can sense a certain amount of integrity in him. I can't see him murdering anybody. Park, you must be wrong. You must. The tension is building, Taff. You can feel it. She moved out of his arm. And you love it, don't you? It's bread and wine to you, Park. There's a faint streak of evil in you. Man is a predatory animal, he said happily. She sighed. Too late to change you now. I should have adopted you when you were a baby. Foster mother, at the age of seven? I matured early. He lay rigid in the darkness, remembering, remembering. It was Lisa's fault. No one could get around that. He had told her he loved her. He had told her this affair with Hewitt had to stop at once. But she laughed. Even when he told her she would be very sorry if she continued to torture him this way. He cried, and she laughed again and again. Sin must be punished whenever it is found. There is no wrong in that. And this great clown Falkner can do nothing because there will never be any clue. He knew from the way he had acted that Lisa had never told him about the scene. When Falkner came down, Taffy, Georgie, Guy, and Stacy Bryan were eating breakfast on the patio, shielded from the brisk morning wind. He heard them laughing before he saw them. They made room for him. He had touched his bell a few minutes before coming down. Mrs. Mick brought him his breakfast tray. Georgie said, I was telling them 
about home in Scranton when I had a crush on a guy who drove a hearse. We didn't have any place to be alone, so we used to go and neck in the room where they stored the coffins. Well, this one time, Joey heard the boss coming back unexpected, so what does he do? But pop me in a box and put the lid and then make like he's taking an inventory. My God, I was petrified. It's dusty. I sneeze. The boss says, what's that? He opens the lid and says, girl, you ain't dead. Joey, the dope, says, her aunt died. She was looking for a box. Next time I see Joey, he's driving a bread truck. Terrible kind of breakfast talk, isn't it? But on this house party, maybe it isn't so far out of line after all. You say you and this Joey had a place where you could be alone? Guy Durana said. That isn't a question, I'm just thinking out loud. Stop making like a detective, Stacy Bryan said. He's working on our little problem, Taffy said. Can't you see the look of the hunter? What kind of a detective you want, Stacy Bryan said. A Jimmy Stewart type? Like this? Well, I guess all you, uh... Nice people need a, a, a little detecting done around here. Or how about an Edward G. Robinson? Like so, listen to me, sugar. You got to lay it right on the line, see? You're not talking to no small town copper, see? This is the big time, sugar, see? They laughed and applauded. The imitations had been uncannily accurate. Hewlett came into the patio, and the look of him quenched the high spirits. His eyes appeared to have receded back into his head. His mouth was a thin, bitter line. Good morning, all, he said. Fun and games? You look rocky, honey, Georgie said. He smiled coldly. Bad dreams, copywriter's dreams. I could see Lisa with her eyes bulging and hands around her throat, but I couldn't tell whose hands. Oh, Georgie said. By the way, Bill Park said, I'm assuming that you would like to find out whether or not one of your friends killed her. I'm assuming you'll help by answering questions. Did you and Lisa have a place where you used to go to be alone? It's not any of your business, Hewitt snapped. Blunt and to the point. We did have a farmhouse so broken down you couldn't go into it. Just a foundation where the barn had been. But you could drive in there and not be seen from the road. She used to pack lunches and we'd picnic there. Did you ever go separately? Sure. We'd meet there. She had a car. You know that already. It was a newspaper's. They found the car five days later in a big parking lot on West 41st Street. Nobody would say who'd driven it there. Maybe she did. I used to take a bus out to Alden Village and walk to the farm. Did you tell the police that, Park asked. Why should I? She never went there except when we went together or when we were going to meet there. Her body might be there, Hewitt. She could have been decoyed there. How do you mean? A faked message from you. It wouldn't be hard. Any of your apartment mates could get their hands on your handwriting. Bill Hewitt looked down at his plate. Suddenly, he looked no longer young, as though he had donned the mask he would wear in middle age. I went back once, alone. It was like visiting some damnable cemetery. The wind whined. She could be there all right. I'll wire the New York police, tell them the name of the farm, or how to direct them to it. About a mile and a half north of the village, on the left, on a curve, Route 8. They call it the Harmon Place. Part 3. Confession. He sent the wire after breakfast. At 11.30, they were all out by the pool. Park was nursing a purpling bruise high in his cheek, where Mick Rogers had tagged them heavily during the usual morning workout. Mick hummed as he made drinks. He seemed well pleased with himself. Gotta remember to keep that left hand higher, boss, he said, grinning. Taffy swam effortless lengths of the pool, her brown arms lifting slowly from the pale green water. Stacy Bryan, in deference to his red-headed lack of skin pigmentation, was the only one in the shade. Stocky Prine Smith was whispering to June Luce. He was propped up on his elbows. She lay on her back with plastic link cups on her eyes to protect them from the sun glare. From time to time she giggled in a throaty way. Stacy glared over at them. Georgie Wayne was trying to teach Big Guy Durana how to make a racing turn against the end of the pool. From the amplifier came muted music, jazz piano by Errol Garner and Mary Lou Williams and Art Tatum. The last record, won by Garner, had played twice. Park thought of sending Mick up to reverse the stack, but suddenly an idea came to him. He went up himself, walking slowly, planning it in detail. 
It was based on the sensitive mic he had hooked into the set. Once, when it had been left turned on quite inadvertently, during a party, one couple who had sneaked away from the crowd came back to find that every word, every sound, had blared out above the noise of the music. Yet had to make the mic installed to simplify some of the problems of running the household. He reversed a stack of records, waited for the music to start, clicked on the mic at the point of a loud remembered chord in the music, hoping that it wouldn't be heard. He picked the table, mic up gingerly, and carried it away from the set. He sat on the bedside table, picked up the phone, and dialed the number of the hotel. Before anyone could answer, he pushed the receiver down with his finger. Give me Mr. Norris's room, please. 412, I think it is. Hello, Lieutenant Norris? This is Faulkner. I guess your trip hasn't been a waste after all. Yes, I think I know who our man is. Right. He'll crack under the strain, and we'll have something definite to go on. Yes, I'll call you just as soon as... The door burst open and Mick came running, panting from the run up the stairs. Hey, the mic's on. Every word is coming over the... Park reached out quickly and clicked the mic off. He grinned. Thanks, Mick. He hung up the phone. Mick's eyes went with comprehension. So, a fake, is it? Did you hear what I said? No, I started running when I heard you dial. Park repeated the conversation. What do you think, he asked. Mick scrubbed his heavy jaw with his knuckles. It ought to make the guy pretty and easy. I can't figure which one it could be. Maybe it isn't any one of them there. I'm placing my bet that it is one of them. They went back down. The atmosphere had changed. Hewitt was the color of watery milk under his two-day tan. He stood with his fists clenched, staring at his friends, one by one. June had sat up, moved a bit away from Prine Smith. Taffy stood near the diving tower, toweling herself. Georgie sat alone on the edge of the pool, her feet in the water. Guy Dorana stood behind her, his eyes slitted against the sunlight, looking half asleep. Stacy Bryan looked at Hewitt and said, Easy, boy, easy. I'm terribly sorry that happened. Park said it shouldn't have happened. Like a fool, I forgot the mic was on. I'm afraid I forewarned the man who killed Lisa Mann. Hewitt walked over to Park. Who is it, he said. Tell me who it is. Not quite yet, Bill, Park said soothingly. Tell me, damn you. I don't think I'm wrong. But there's always that chance. I'm not ready to tell you. You're in no emotional condition to handle yourself properly, if I should tell you. Hewlett threw his fist full at Faulkner's face with an almost girlish ineptitude. Park caught the fist in the palm of his hand and squeezed down on it. Hewitt's mouth changed to the impact of the sudden pain. Don't try that again, Park said. Hewitt yanked his hand free, turned without a word, and walked across to the house. Everyone started to make bright, shallow conversation to cover the awkwardness. Taffy came over to Park and lowered her voice so that only he could hear her. Dirty pool, friend, she said. A very dirty pool. I don't understand, Taff. The music suddenly got louder and then faded back again. The mic stands near the set. You should have carried it over to the phone before turning it on. You know, you'd be a very difficult type to be married to. I don't think I can quite class that as a proposal. You and your mythical lieutenants. He grinned with a flash of white teeth against the deep brown of his face. That's where I got you, Taff. There is a Lieutenant Norris, and he is registered at the hotel, and he is from New York. But he's an extradition case. If I can't give him something to get his teeth into by tomorrow night, he has to start back with his man. He fell silent, and the talk around him was meaningless. It had to be a clever trap. There was nothing Faulkner could know. Nothing. But the man was clever. It took cleverness to locate a body 1,600 miles away. A body that had been searched for by experts. They might not find it. Probably they would. He had not risked going back to see if the dirt had settled. The laboratories would go to work on the body. He had carried the body a short distance. Could some microscopic bit of evidence have been left? Dusk broke upon the badminton doubles. The last set had seen Guy Durana and June Luce against Georgie and Stacy Bryan. Everyone had played in their swimsuits. Bryan's wiry quickness had made up for Durana's advantage in height. Georgie was nursing a swollen underlip, which in some strange fashion she had managed to club with her own racket. All four were winded. Mick had wheeled the rolling bar out into the edge of the court, plugging in the ice compartment at the outlet 
near the tenants' court floodlights. Sometimes, Stacy said, it's good to be cumbushed. When the infantry reluctantly let me go, I swore I'd never get physically tired again for the rest of my life. Here I am running around in the sun and beating on a cork with feathers sticking out of it. Infantry, Dorana said with heavy disgust, why didn't you pick yourself a branch? Don't tell me what you were, God, Georgie said. Let me guess. A fly boy, a hot pilot, a tired hat and nine rows of ribbons. Not a hot pilot, Guy said. I pushed tired, cold C-40s and 47s around for the ATC. I was too big to fit into a fighter with any comfort, but old Prine here had the real deal. Warm food, good bed, all the luxuries, of course. They sank a couple of ships under him, but that navy was it. How about Bill? June asked. What was he? O-W-I. Hell, I wish he'd come down out of his room and stop talking. Taffy laughed. You know what our jolly host did for his country? Whatever it was, I bet it was a job smarter than the one Stace picked, Kai said. Before she could reply, Hewlett came out of the gray darkness. Sorry I blew my top, he murmured. Quite all right, Park said. You see, Hewitt continued, if I lose my head, I won't get my cracks at whoever killed Lisa. I've got to stay calm. I have it all figured out. As soon as you know for sure, you'll tell that lieutenant but maybe I can find out for sure before you do, Faulkner. And if I do, he might not stand trial. Whoever he is, I'm beginning to get an idea. Stacy Bryan stood up and shivered. That wind's getting cooler. Or have I got a chill just because there's a murderer in the house? Goodbye, you people. I'm off for a shower. The group slowly split up until only Prine Smith and Park Faulkner were left. Mick wheeled the barn side. Prine Smith's face was in shadow. He said... I can almost see your point. A dilettante in crime. Gives you a purpose in life, maybe. His tone was speculative. But human beings aren't puppets, Faulkner. They take over the strings. They make up their own lines. I've done some checking. You've had considerable violence here on your group or island. Do you sleep well at night? Like a baby. I've been in the newspaper game longer than you'd think to look at me, Faulkner. I can smell violence in the air. Something is going to bust open here. It's possible. What precautions are you taking? I think that should be pretty valuable information to someone. Don't be a fool. You can't possibly suspect me. Faulkner was surprised at the trace of anger in his own voice. Don't try to judge me or my method, Smith. Don't set yourself up as an arbiter of my moral codes or lack of same. A girl died. There's the justification. In the darkness, he could sense Prime Smith's grin as he stood up. Glad to know you sometimes doubt yourself, Faulkner. Maybe I'll like you better. He went off to the house. Faulkner stayed a few minutes more. Sometimes there is safety in inaction, he thought. And sometimes it is wise to move quickly. He locked the door, opened the toilet article kit, took out the small bottle of white powder. It was cool against his palm. They said that later the lips smelled of almonds, he wondered. Bill Hewitt looked full into the eyes of his friend. The others were by the beach fire. Hewitt knew that he had drunk too much. Faulkner's room wavered dizzily. He struggled for soberness. He said thickly, You said you could tell me who killed Lisa. I can. What's that you've got? A record? What have you been doing here? It seems to be a funny place to meet. The host's room. Yes, this is a record. I got here first. I made a record on his machine. You mean, you say on the record who killed her? you had asked. That's right, here. Have a drink. Then we'll listen to it, together. Can't you just tell me? He would ask plaintively. He tilted the glass high, drained it. Now I can tell you. I'll put this record on the spindle, like this. Who is it? Who killed her? You did, Hewitt. You killed her, can't you remember? What kind of a damn fool joke is this? His friend went quickly toward the door, opened it, glanced out into the hall. He turned. Goodbye, Bill. Give my regards to Lisa, my very best regards. I think you might live another ten seconds after that drink I gave you. The door shut softly. Hewitt stared at the empty glass. It slipped from his hands to the rug, bounced, didn't break. He put both hands to his throat and turned dizzily. The room was bright on the small private terrace. He saw a brown arm, almost black in the moonlight, reach over the terrace wall, saw a man pull himself up quickly. Hewitt fell to his knees. 
They were all near the fire, the ember glow reddening their face. Mick was telling them how the lights went out in round five, during his bout with John Henry Lewis. Park came close to them. Mick looked over and stopped talking. What is it? Taffy asked quickly. I've just told Norris to come over. The local police will be here too. Our little house party's over, I'm afraid. Georgie Wayne looked around the circle. Where's Bill? she demanded. Bill is in my room. He's very dead and not at all pretty. Poison. He heard the hard intake of breath. Taffy said, Oh no. Before he did it, he left his confession. I think you might like to hear it. Mick, go on up and play the record that's on the spindle right now. Pipe it out the front terrace. We'll walk over there to listen. Mick went across the sand and into the darkness. They stood up slowly, full of the embarrassed gravity with which any group meets the death of one of their number. Taffy came next to Park in the darkness as they walked, her fingers chill on his wrist. No, Park, I can't believe it. They stood on the front terrace close to the sea. The amplifier made a scratching sound, the voice that came with thin, taut emotion. There was no need for the voice to identify itself. I can't pretend any more. She said she was through with me. She told me she was fed up with neurotics. I had her meet me at the farm. Faulkner trapped me about that. I took a shovel and coveralls. I came up behind her, struck her with a flat of the shovel blade. I carried her fifty feet into the woodlot and buried her there. I burned the shovel handle and the coveralls. I drove her car back and put in the busiest lot I could find and tore up the check. I couldn't face the thought of her going to someone else, someone else's arms around her and lips on hers. I'm not sorry, not sorry at all. There was a dry rasping sound of needle and empty grooves and then silence as Mick lifted the arm. Crazy, June Lu said softly. Plain crazy. Gee, the poor guy. Sirens shrilled through the distant night. Coming closer, Park said quickly, Go on into the front living room, all of you. They'll take the body out, and then Norris will probably want to talk to you. I see no reason why it might not be simple routine. Part 4. The Man from the Dead It was a full forty-five minutes after the cars had swung across the private causeway and Park that Lieutenant Norris came into the front living room. He was a tall, stooped, sick-looking man with a face that showed the lean fragility of the bone structure underneath. He wore an incongruous dark suit and his eyes were remote, disinterested. Let's get it over, he said. You're Smith, no? Oh, Dorana. And you're Brian. Okay. I got you all straight now, I guess. I can question you all at once. Did you had seem depressed since you've been here? Several people said yes at the same moment. Georgie said, the guy was pretty antisocial. I thought it was because his gal had disappeared. I've been wrong before. Now, said Norris, about this beach party tonight. Anybody see him leave? There was silence. Park said. The sea was warm. About half the group were swimming from time to time. You couldn't really keep track of any individual. I guess that one time or another, every one of us wandered off. I found you it, as I told you, when I went up to my room to change to dry clothes. It was getting just a little chilly. Prine Smith crossed his arms. Let's drop this patty cake routine, shall we? Norris stared coldly at him. What's on your mind? Hewitt was drinking too much. That record sounds too sober to me, and I knew Hewitt inside and out. I say nuts to this suicide angle. Lisa was his gal, and she meant every look she gave him. I'm the only one outside of Bill and Lisa that knew the wedding date was set. I thought Faulkner's idea was a bust for a time, but I've felt the tension growing here, and now I think I know the angle. He spun, took two steps towards Stacy Bryan. Come on, kid. Make imitations for the people. Show them how you can be Jimmy Stewart or Edward G. Robinson or Bill Hewitt. Maybe you were Bill Hewitt over the phone when you got Lisa to go out there to that farm. Bill never killed himself. He had more guts than any of you know. For my money, Stacy, you got him up there to Faulkner's room, made the record yourself, and slipped him a drink with the stuff in it. Stacy Bryan turned as white as a human being can turn. He came out of the chair like a cold spring, suddenly released. His fist batted off Brian Smith's mouth before Smith could lift his arm. Park leaped up and grabbed Brian from behind. He struggled and then gave it up. Will you be good? Park asked. Stacy Bryan nodded. Park released him. Stacy said in a level monotone, Any guy who can think of that kind of an angle probably did it himself. 
He was on the make for Lisa ever since the first time Bill brought her around. We all knew that. We didn't tell the cops because we didn't think he was a guy to kill anybody. Sure, I make imitations. But if any of you think I did a thing like that, you can all go to hell in a basket. Norris drawled. You guys can slap each other around until you're tired. It doesn't make no never mind to me. I got my case solved. I like the solution. Hewlett smeared his gal and covered it nice. I got the dope today. They found the body, just like he said in the record. But damn it, man, Prine said. Can't you see that Brian could put that same dope on the record and make it sound just like Hewitt? Stacy said, Smith, I don't want to ever see you or talk to you or hear your name again as long as I live. I'm going back to New York just as fast as I can get there, and I'm packing my stuff and moving out of that apartment we got two months ago. Good, Smith said. You sound like a couple of babies, Guy Durana said. He's a slick one, he is, Prine said. He even did his imitations here for us, because he knew that if he didn't do them, somebody would wonder why he'd given up his pet party trick. Nora sighed. I'm tired. You people are trying to foul my case. Sleep on it, will you? Nobody leaves the island. I'll be back in the morning. They've taken the body to town. He looked around with a sudden, surprising, wry amusement. How funny, said. He turned and left the room. Guy whispered to Georgie and then said to the room at large, We're taking a walk. The air is fresh out there. Be back in half an hour, Park said. Well, I'll meet at the enclosed patio at the rear of the house. I think that by then we'll be able to talk calmly and iron out this trouble. Never, Stacy Bryan said calmly. But you'll give it a try. If it'll amuse you, it's your party. Park walked off the terrace out into the night and sat in the sand his back against the concrete sea wall. He heard a sound and looked up over his right shoulder. Taffy stood there with her elbows on the wall, her head bent, her thick white hair falling toward him, a sheen in the pale moonlight behind her. He's right, you know, Smith, she said. There was utter sadness in her voice. Don't fret, Taff. The poor lost man, poor Bill. This is a night for losing things. We're lost too, you know. How do you mean that? I could go along in your plans. Before this happened, Park, I told myself you were doing good, but I really didn't believe it. Now boy is dead, Park, and boy stayed dead a long time. It's been nice. He found her hand. Trust me. I want to, but I can't. Not any more, because this thing that happened is wrong. Norris is a fool. You're being a fool, too. I don't want to lose you, Taff. But you did. When Bill died, you lost me. Old Taff. The world mother, the open warm heart for lost dogs and children. Don't make bright talk. Just kiss me and say goodbye like a little man. You can't go now. I'll stay until morning, but this is a good time for goodbye. When he came in with Taff, they were all in the enclosed patio. The wall lights were on the bulbs of that old orange that repels insects. Postmortem, June Lou said. Postmortem by my generous uncle who pays me fifty bucks a day to grace his lovely home, she laughed. There was liquor in her laugh. Please shut up, dear, Georgie said. Well, Park said, it all seems to be over, and I, for one, am satisfied with Norris's conclusion. I'm happy for you, Pride Smith said. You're easily satisfied. Guy Durana stood with his big arms around Georgie's slim waist. He rubbed his chin against her sleek golden head. Taffy wore the look of a lost child. Make by the corner bar was glum. He didn't die easy, Park said. It was quick, but from the look of his face, there wasn't anything easy about it. Is this discussion necessary? June asked. Even at fifty a day, there's a limit. I'm switching to bourbon, Mick, Stacy said. June glanced beyond Faulkner to the stone arch that led out into the side garden. She made a sound. It was not a scream. It was harsh and long and came from the deepest part of her lungs. Park moved to one side. Guy Durana had his arm around Georgie Wayne's waist. With one heave of his shoulders, he flung her to the side. She spun, tripped, and fell hard. Bell Hewitt, ghastly pale, in the archway, his mouth twisting so that lips were pale worms entwining, said, I left some unfinished business behind, I think. Prine Smith stood without a movement, with no expression at all in his face. Stacy Bryan stood with the glass in his hand. His hand shut, and the glass made a brittle sound. A cloud of blood dropped and spattered on the stone. 
Guy Durana stood with his hands flattened against the wall behind him. No, he whispered. No. His big pale hand flickered in the light, disappeared, reappeared with a glint of metal. Bill Hewitt took a slow step toward Guy. The gun spoke, a slapping, stick-breaking sound metallic in the enclosed patio. He fired point blank at Bill Hewitt. He fired six times. The hammer clicked three more times. The gun dropped onto the stone. Hewitt took another slow step toward Durana, grinning now, grinning in a ghastly fashion. Durana's big, handsome face lost its human look. The features seemed to grow loose and fluid. Knee bones thudded against the stone. It was as though he were at prayer, worshipping some new and inhuman god. His lips moved and he made sounds, muted little growlings and goblings that were zoo sounds. Norris came in from the garden, as though walking into a drugstore for a pack of cigarettes. Okay, he said, print that. It ought to do it. On your feet, Durana. Guy looked up at him and said the words, pasted stickily together. There's nothing you can do to me because it is part of me to avenge and destroy. There is sin and weakness in the world. Weakness and sin. They have to be punished. I'm an instrument of death. The garden and the word. The time is now. All the rich orchard time of turning, and no man is known who can unbend the others. He glared around at them, then slipped down onto his haunches and began idly patting the stone with the palm of his hand, cooing softly, crooning to himself. Ain't it that the way, Nora said with disgust. You go to all this trouble, and what do you get? He flips the wig, just as you grab him. Well, maybe we piled it on a little strong. Help me, you guys. If he's violent, he'll be tough to handle. But Guy Durana let himself be led out placidly. He looked vacantly at Georgia on the way out. She put the back of her hand to her lips, and her eyes were wide and terrified. They gathered in Faulkner's room. It was two in the morning. The fireplace fire drove back the night chill. Georgie's burned knee and elbow had been bandaged. She had lost almost all her casual flippancy. "'What can you believe about people?' Prine Smith asked. "'I had Durano pretty well evaluated in my own mind. A big handsome hunk, with more of a spark of acting talent than he was willing to admit. I had him pegged to go to a long way. Hollywood had nibbled once, but he didn't like the offer. How do you figure it, Park?' Faulkner shrugged. Women came running to him. He must have alternated between thinking he was a minor god and feeling a strong sense of guilt, probably the result of a strict childhood home life. Guilt can do odd things. He must have been on the edge when he made a play for Lisa. She turned him down. There was something new. He brooded over it. The one woman he wanted he couldn't have. And Hewitt's happiness with her was like a blow in the face. He was an actor. He could do tricks with that voice of his. We'll never know for sure, probably, but I think he phoned her pretending to be you, Bill. I guess you can fill out the rest of the details. He justified himself by saying to himself that he was punishing her for a sin. Park turned to Prine again. Precautions were very simple. Lou and Nick took turns, going through your rooms, deactivating anything that looked lethal. Lou was the one who found the gun while Guy was swimming. He reloaded it with frangible blanks that looked like the McCoy. Mick found the unlabeled bottle. He emptied it on a hunch, washed it, refilled it in the kitchen. While we swam at night, Lou was out beyond the breaker line in the Nancy, watching with night glasses to see that nothing funny happened. I saw Durana talk to Bill and then leave in the direction of the house. In a little while, Bill followed along. I followed him. When I saw him go into my room, I went down into the terrace below mine, climbed up. Guy left the room as I came over the wall. Poor Bill thought he'd really been poisoned. When I convinced him that he hadn't, he was shaken enough to be willing to play ball with us. I called Norris and explained it to him. We need a little more on Durana than Bill's naked word. Well, we got it. Hewlett said, It's over now, I guess. I knew all along she must be dead. But because I didn't know who or how, I couldn't relax. Now I can start rebuilding. Can you use any help? June asked, smiling. Hewitt grinned. I'll consider it. The group broke up. Park promised transportation after breakfast. Taffy and Georgie Wayne lingered behind. Georgie gave Taffy a quick look, and then she smiled at Park, saying, Here I am wounded. Look, does a girl get a chance to stay here for a few days? Recuperation, we could call it, and it won't cost you fifty a day. Only what I can eat. Park looked expressionlessly at Taffy. Why, I suppose that would be. Taffy gave Georgie the warmest smile in her book. 
Darling, Mr. Falconer intends to give you a little bonus to take care of that scraped knee and elbow. I really think it would be best for all concerned if you went with the others. Georgie shrugged. Sorry, boss. I didn't see any sandwich signs on him. Night all. Taffy shut the door firmly. She turned, her hands on her lips. If you think for one minute I'd let you keep that, that female here after you the others go? Park gave her a look of outraged innocence. But you told me we were through. Well, we aren't. Any argument? He didn't give her an argument. He was too busy.